Ashley Brock, reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 14. Philip unlocked the boatyard at 7 a.m. The very fact that his brothers hadn't given him grief about not working the day before or about taking a full Sunday off the previous week had his guilt quota at peak. He expected he had a good hour, maybe a little more, before Cam showed up to continue work on the hall of the sports fisher. Ethan would put in a morning of crabbing, taking advantage of the full season before heading into work that afternoon. So he would have the place to himself in the quiet and solitude to deal with the paperwork he neglected the week before. Quiet didn't mean silent. His first act when entering his cramped office was to hit the lights. The next was to switch on the radio. Ten minutes later, he was nose deep in accounts and very much at home. Well, they owed just about everybody, he concluded. Rent, utilities, insurance, premiums, the lumber yard, and the ever popular MasterCard. The government had demanded its share in the middle of September, and the bite had been just a little nasty. The next tax nibble wasn't far enough away to let him relax. He juggled figures, toyed with them, stroked them, and decided red wasn't such a bad color. They made a tiny profit on their first job, the bulk of which had been poured back into the business. Once they turned the hole, they would get another draw from their current client that would keep their heads above water. But they weren't going to see a lot of color black, for, a lot of the color black for a time yet. Dutifully, he cut checks, updated the spreadsheets, reconciled figures, tried not to mourn the fact that two, and two stubbornly insists on making four. <laughs> insist on making four. He heard the heavy door blow open, then slam. Hiding up there again. Cam caught him. Yeah, having a real party. Some of us have real work to do. Philip looked at the girls dancing over his computer screen and laughed. Surely it wasn't real work to Cam, he knew, unless you had a tool in your hand. Best I can do, he muttered and shut the computer down. He stacked the outgoing bills on the counter of the desk, tucked the paychecks in his back pocket, then headed down. Cam was strapping on a tool belt. He wore a ball cap backward to keep his hair out of his eyes, and it flowed beneath the downslope bill. Phil watched him slide the wedding band off his finger and tuck it carefully in his front pocket, just as he would take it out. After work, Philip Muse and slipped back in place. Rings could catch on tools and cost a man a finger, but neither of his brother left theirs at home. He wondered if there was symbolism or comfort in having that statement of marriage on them one way or the other at all times. Then he wondered why he was wondering and nudging the question and the idea of it aside. Since Cam had reached the work area first, the radio wasn't turned to the lazy blues Philip had would have chosen, but the loud kiss my ass rock came item coolly as Philip tugged on its oop out of his own. Didn't expect to see you in so bright and early this morning because you had a late night. Don't go over there again. Just a comment. Anna had already chewed him out when he complained to her about Philip's involvement with the bill. He should be shamed. He shouldn't interfere. He should have a compassion for his brother's feelings. He'd rather take that brother's fist in the face any day than a hot verbal slap from his wife. <laughs> you want to fool around with her is your business. She's a pleasure to look at. I'd say she'd got a wide cold streak in her, though. You don't know her. And you do. Came lifting a hand and feels ass. She's trying to get a handle on it. It's going to matter to Seth. I know she's willing to do what she can, so he's where he needs to be. Reading between the lines, I say she grew up in a repressed, restrictive atmosphere. A rich one. Yeah. Felt strode to Powell. Yeah, private school, chauffeurs, country club, servants. It's a little tough to feel sorry for. I don't think she's looking for sympathy. Eve the plane. You said you wanted to get a handle on her. I'm telling you she had a man she had advantages. I don't know if she had affection. Cam shrugged. Decided they'd get more accomplished working together. Took the other end of the plank to fix it into place on the wall. She doesn't strike me as deprived. She strikes me as cold. Restrained. Cautious. He remembered the way she reached out to him the night before. Still, it had been the first time she'd done so. The only time. He clamped down on the frustration of not being sure that Cam wasn't right. And you and in the only ones entitled to a relationship with a woman that satisfies your hormones and your brain? No. Cam lapped the ends, deliberately relaxed his shoulders. There was something in Philip's voice that gave him the frustration. Away that frustration and something. No, we're not. I'll talk to Seth about her. I'll talk to him myself. All right. He matters to me, too. I know he does. He didn't. Philip pulled out his hammer. You know, not as much as he did to you. Not enough. It's different now. 
I know that too. For the few next few minutes, they worked in tandem. That was, he stood up for him anyway. Can't matter when the plank was, even when he didn't matter enough. I did it for Dad. We all did it for Dad. Now we're doing it for Seth. But I knew the skeleton of the hole had taken on the flesh of wood. The smooth lap construction was labor intense, tedious, and exacting. But it was their trademark, a choice that often offered extreme structural strength and required great skill by the built boat builder. No one would argue that Cam was the most skilled of the three of them in woodworking, but Philip thought he was holding his own. Yeah, he's not standing back to scan the exterior planking or skin of the hall. He was holding his own. You pick up any lunch? Cam asked before he poured water from a jug into his mouth. No. Shit. I bet Grace packed eggs and one of those monster lunches of hers. Fried chicken or thick slabs of honey baked ham. <laughs> you got a wife, Phil pointed out. Cam snorted on Oh, yeah. I can just see me talking to Anna and a pack of me a lunch every day. She'll smack me with a briefcase as she marched out the door to work. There are two of us, he considered. We can take Ethan, especially if we catch him by surprise. When he comes in... Let's go the easy route. Philip dug into his pocket, pulled out a coin. Heads or tails? Heads. Loser gets it and buys it. Philip flipped the coin, got it, and slapped it on the back of his hand. The eagle's beak seemed to sneer at him. Damn it. What do you want? We both sub large chips and six gallons of coffee. Fine. Clock your arteries. Last I checked, they don't stock any tofu at Crawford's. Don't know how you eat that crap. You're gonna die anyway. Might as well go with me meatball sub. <laughs> You go your way, I'll go mine. He reached in his pocket again. Pam's picture. Here, don't spend it all in one place. Now I can retire to that little grass shack in one molly. You got Ethan's? What there is of it? Yours? I don't need it. Cam narrowed his eyes and Phil pulled on his jacket. That's not the way it works. I'm in charge of the books. I say how it works. You put in your time, you take your share. I don't need it, Phil said. We'll eat it this time. When I do, I'll take it. He's talked out, leaving camp human. Stubborn son of a bitch, Cam. How am I supposed to rag on him when he pulls crap like that? He bitched plenty, Cam mused. He nagged his brothers to distraction over the prettiest detail. Pettiest detail, then he, ha he handles the details. He thought as he capped the water jug. He'd back you into a corner, then he'd go to the wall for you. It was enough to drive you crazy. Now he's getting himself twisted up over a woman. None of them knew they could trust if things got sticky. He for, he, for one, was going to keep a close eye on some Bill Griffin, and not just for sake. Philip might have the brains, but he was just as stupid as the next guy when it came to a pretty face. And young Karen Lawson, who's been working down at the hotel since she hooked up with the McKinney boy last year, saw it written down in black and white. She called her mama, and that's Biddy Lawson's good friend of mine and my longtime bridge partner, though she'll trump your ace if you don't watch her. She called me right up and let me know. Nancy Claremont was in her element, and that element was gossip, as her husband owned a sizable chunk of St. Chris meaning she did as well and part of that chunk was the old barn those quinn boys wild bunch of them if you ask her rented for their bowyard though god knew what else went on in there she knew it was not only her right but her duty to pass on the circular tidbit that had come her way the previous afternoon of course she used the most convenient method first the telephone but she didn't get the pleasure of face-to-face -face reaction over the phone so she brought herself out dressed in a brand new pumpkin collared pantsuit fresh out of the jc penny catalog there were no point there's no point in being the most well off woman in St. Christopher if you didn't flaunt it a bit. And the best place to flaunt it and spread gossip was Crawford. Second best was the circular beauty salon over on market, and that as she made an appointment for cut collar and curl was her next stop. Mother Crawford, a fixture in St. Chris for all of her sixty two years, sat behind the counter in her smeared butcher apron, her tongue tucked firmly in her cheek. She already heard the news. Not much got by mother and nothing got by her for long, but she disposed herself to hear Nancy out. To think that child is Ray Quinn's grandson. Now right or later with her snooty airs, who's the sister of that nasty girl, said all those terrible things. That boy's her nephew, her own kin, but did she say one more about it? No, sir, she did not. Just hooting, tooting around, going off sailing with Philip Crennan, a lot more than sailing, if you ask me. The way young people carry on them today was snap your their fingers to morals. She snapped her own inches from Mother's face, and her eyes glittered with malice delight. Since Mother sensed that Nancy was about to veer off the subject at hand, she shrugged her wide shoulders. Seems to me, she began, knowing the scattered people in the store had their ears bent to her. 
that there are a lot of people around this town who ought to be hanging their heads after what they were passing around about Ray, whispering about him behind his back when he was living, and over his grave when he passed on, about him cheating on Stella, God rest her, and having trucked with that Delatner woman. Well, it wasn't true, was it? Her sharp eyes scanned the store, and a few heads did lower. Satisfied, she beamed her gaze into hard into Nancy's glittering eyes. Seems to me you were willing enough to behave, believe bad about a good man like Ray Quinn. Sincerely insulted, and this puffed out. Nancy puffed out her teeth. Why, I never believed a word of him, Mother. Discussing such matters, she thought to herself was the same as believing them. Truth is, a blind man couldn't have missed the way that boy's got Ray's eyes. Had to be blood relation. Why, I said to Silas just the other day, I said, Silas, I wonder if that boy could be cousin or something to Ray. <laughs> she said no such thing, of course, but she might have. She thought of it. Never thought about being Ray's grandson, though. Why, to think Ray had a daughter all these years. Which, of course, proved he'd done something wrong in the first place, didn't it? <laughs> she always suspected that Ray Quinn had been wild in his youth, maybe even a hippie. And everybody knew what that meant, smoking marijuana and having orgies and running around naked, but that wasn't something she intended to bring up to mother. That little morsel could wait until she was shampooed and tucked into the styling kit chair at the salon. Now she turned out wilder than those boys he and Stella brought home. She, that girl over to the hotel must be just as she broke off when the door jingled open for a fresh ear. She was thrilled to see Philip Quinn walk in, better than an addition to her audience. It was one of the actors of the very interesting stage. Philip only only had to open the door to know what subject was under discussion or had it until he stepped inside. Silas fell with a clang, and their eyes darted toward him, then guiltily away, except for Nancy Claymont's, Claymont's and mothers. Why? Philip Quinn, I don't know, as I've seen you since your family picnic on the 4th of July. Nancy fluttered at him. Wild or not, he was a handsome man. Nancy considered flirting one of the best ways. Flirting one of the best ways to lose a man's tongue. That was a fine day. Yes, it was. He walked up the counter, knowing the stairs were being bulleted at his back. I need a couple subs, Mother Crawford, a meatball and a turkey. We'll fix you up. Phil Junior, she shouted over at her son, who jolted at her tone despite being 36 in the fall of three. Yes, him. You gonna ring out these people or just scratch your butt the rest of the afternoon? He got alert, muttered on her breath, and turned his attention back to the cash register. You working down at the boat yard today, Philip? That's right, Mrs. Claremont. He busied himself choosing a bag of chips for Cam, then wandered back to the dairy case to decide on yogurt for himself. That young boy usually comes in to pick up punches, don't he? Philip reached in, took out a cart, and I ran him. He's in school today. It's Friday. Of course it is. Nancy laughed, playfully parting, patting the side of her head. Don't know where my mind is. Fine looking young boy. Ray must have been right proud. I don't doubt it. We've been hearing that he got some blood relation close by. <laughs> There's never been anything wrong with you here, Mrs. Claymore. That I recall. I need a couple large coffees to go, Mother. <laughs> we'll fix you up there. Nancy, you go. Got more than enough news to blow around for the day. You keep trying to squeeze more out of this boy, you're gonna miss your hair appointment. I don't know what you could be meaning. Nancy sniffed, shot Mother Fierce glyph, and fluffed at her hair. But I have to do do be going. In. Husband and I are going to Kiwi's Kiwanis dinner dance tonight, and I need to look my best. She flaunced out, making beelines for the beauty shop. Inside Mother narrow eyes. The rest of you got business? Jen will ring you up, but this ain't no lounge. You want to stand around and got go out, stand outside. <laughs> this guy's a chuckle. Was a cow. Several people decided they had business elsewhere. And Nancy Claymont's got less sense than a pinhead. Mother pronounced. Bad enough, she dresses herself up like a pumpkin from head to toe, but she don't even know how to be subtle. <laughs> Mother turned back to film girl. Now, I won't say I don't have as much got to know as the next, but by God, if you can't try to jiggle a little information out of a body without being so blessed and obvious, you're not just rude, you're stupid with it. Can't abide bad manners or soft brain. Feel <laughs> clean on the counter. You know, Mother, I've been thinking maybe I've changed my name. Changed my name to Jean Claude, the move to the wine country to France, the Little Valley, and buy myself a vineyard. She tucked her tongue in her cheek, eyes right. She heard this tale, or one of writings for years to tell. I'd watch my grapes ripen in the sun. I'd eat bread that was hot and fresh, and cheese that wasn't. It would be fine, satisfying life. But I've just got one problem. 
What's that? It wouldn't be any good unless you come with me. He grabbed her hand, kissing her lavishly, while she roared with laughter. Boy, you are a caution. Always were. She gasped for breath, wiped her eyes, and she said, Nancy, she's a fool, but she's not me. Not deep down. Ray and Stella, they were just people to her. They were a lot more than that to me. I know them. I know them, mother. People got something new to talk about. They're going to gum it to death. I know that, too. He's, he nodded. So did Sabu. Mother's eyebrows lived and fell as real life's implication. That girl's got guts. God, good for her. Seth, he can't be. He can be proud he's got blood kin that brave. And he can be proud of a man like Ray was his granddaddy. She paused to put the finishing touches on some. I think Ray and Stella would have liked that girl. Do you? Film him. Yep, I like her. Mother grinned again as she gripped. Quickly wrap the subs and white paper. She's not hooty tooty like Nancy wants to think. Girl's just shy. Bill Betts reached over for the subs and now his mouth flew open. Shy. Seville. <laughs> sure is. Tries hard to be not to be, but it costs her some. Now you get that meatball back to your brother for it gets cold. Why do I have to care about a bunch of queeros who lived 200 years ago? Seth had his history book open, his mouth full of gray purple glitches, and a stubborn look in his eye. After a 10-hour day of manual labor, Phil wasn't in the mood for one of Seth's periodic snits. The founding fathers of our country were not queeros. Seth snorted and jabbed a finger at the full-page dawn of the Conditional Congress. They're wearing dookie wigs and girly clothes. That says queero to me. <laughs> it was the fashion. He knew the kid was shaking his chain, but he couldn't seem to stop his leg from jerking on you. <laughs> on the use of the word queero to describe anyone because of their fashion sense or their lifestyle demonstrates ignorance and intolerance. Seth merely smiled. Something like just like making Philip grind his teeth the way it was done now. Guy wears curly wig and high heels. He deserves what he gets. Philip sighed. It was another re reaction Seth enjoyed. He didn't really mind the history crap. He aced the last test that name, but it was just plain boring enough to pick out one of the queeros and write some dopey biograph biography. You know what these guys were? <laughs> Philip demanded. Then narrowed his eyes morning when Seth opened his mouth. Don't say it. <laughs> I'll tell you what they were. Rebels, troublemakers, tough guys, tough guys, get real. Meeting the way they did, drawing up papers, making speeches. They were given England, and most specifically, King George the Finger. He caught a flash of amused interest in Seth's eyes. It wasn't the tea tax, not really. That was just the platform, the excuse. They weren't going to take any shit from England anymore. That's what it came down to. Making speeches and writing papers isn't like fighting. They were making sure there was something to fight for. You have to give people an alternative. If you want them to toss out brand X, you have to give them brand Y. Make it better, stronger, tastier. What if I told you Bubblicious is a ripoff? Bill Bastard's fire as he snatched up the giant pack of Seth's desk. I like it, okay? To prove it, Seth blew an enormous purple bubble. Yeah, but I'm telling you that it sucks and that the people who make it are creeps. You're not gonna... Just toss it in the trash because I say so, right? Damn straight. But if I give you a new choice, if I told you about the super bubble blow. Super bubble blow, man. You slay me. Shut up. SBB is better. It lasts longer. Costs less. Chewing it will make you and your friends, your family, your neighbors happier. Stronger. SBB is the gum of the future. Of your future. SBB is right. Phil, <laughs> Phil patted putting a ring in his voice. Bubble issues is wrong. With SBB, you'll find personal and religious freedom, and no one will ever tell you that you can only have one piece. Cool. Philip was weird, all right. Seth thought with a grin, but he was fun. Where do I sign up? With a half left, Philip tossed a gum back on the desk. Get the picture. These guys were the brains in the blood, and it was their job to get the people excited. The brains in the blood, Seth thought. He liked it. Figured he could work it into his report. Okay, maybe I'll... Pick Patrick Henry. He doesn't look as dorky as some of the other guys. Good. You can access information on him on the computer. When you hit the buy, bibliology books on him, print it out. The library in Baltimore is bound to have more of a selection than the one at school. Okay. And your composition for English is ready to turn in tomorrow. Man, you never let up. Let's see what you've got. Jeez. Trouble it all the way. Set that into his binder and tugged out the single sheets.
It was titled, A Dog's Life, and described a typical day through the eyes of foolish. Phil felt a slip switch as the canine's narrative told of his delight in chasing rabbits, his irritation with bees, the thrill of hanging out with his good and wise friend Simon. Christ, the kid was clever, he mused. As foolish ended his long and demanding tale, curled up in his bed, which he generally shared with his boy. Phil painted the page back. It's great. I guess we know how, now know, how you come by your storytelling talent. Naturally, says Lashes lowered as he caught, carefully slipped the compulsion back to it. Well, yeah, Ray was pretty smart and all. Being a college professor, he was pretty smart. If he'd known about you, he says he'd have done something about it a lot sooner. Yeah, well, says gave that quench order. I'm going to talk to the lawyer tomorrow. We may be able to speed things up a little with some Bill's help. Seth picked up his pencil to do the one as plotter. She shaped circles, triangles, squares. Maybe she'll change her mind. <laughs> no, she won't. People do all the time. <laughs> he waited for weeks, ready to run for the Quins that changed theirs. When they hadn't, he started to believe, but he, all, he was always ready to run. <sighs> Some people keep their promises no matter what. Ray did. She's not Ray. She came here to spy on me. She came to see if you were all right. Well, I am, so she can go. It's harder to stay, Philip said quietly. It takes more guts to stay. People are already talking about her. You know what that's like when people look at you out of the corners of their eyes and whisper? Yeah, they're just jerks. <laughs> Maybe, but it still stings. He knew it did, but he gripped his pencil more tightly, adding pressure to the stool. You just got a case on her. I might. She sure is a looker. But if I do have a case on her that doesn't change the basic facts, kid, you haven't had that many people give a damn about you in your life. He waited until Seth's eyes slid over to his and help. Took me a while, maybe too long, to give God a good damn myself. I did what Ray asked me to do because I loved him. But he didn't want to. No, I didn't want to. It was a, it was a pain in the ass. You were a pain in the ass. But it started to change little by little. I still didn't want to do it. It's still... It was still a pain in the ass, but somewhere along the way, I was doing it for you as much as I was for Ray. He thought maybe I was a kid and it pissed you off. So much felt thought for adults believing that get that's their secrets and sins from children. Yeah, that was one little angle I couldn't get rid of until yesterday. I couldn't accept the idea that he might have cheated on my mother or that you might be his son. But you put my name on the sign anyway. Phil <laughs> stared a moment. And let out a half laugh. Sometimes you realize you do what's right without really thinking about it. And it makes a difference. You belong there. Just like you belong here. And so Bill already got, gave a good, good damn about you. And now we know why. When somebody cares, it's just plain stupid to push them away. I think I should see her and talk to her and stuff. He thought about it. I don't know what to say. You saw and talked to her before you knew. You could try it that way. Maybe. You know how Grace and Anna are all wired up about this birthday dinner of yours next week? Yeah, he lowered his head a little more so the huge grand didn't show. Couldn't believe it. Not really a birthday dinner? And he got to pick the food? Then like a party with pals the next day? Not that he was going to call it a party because that was really lame when you're turning 11. What do you think of asking her if she'd like to come over for that? The family dinner deal. The grin vanished. I don't know. I guess she probably wouldn't want to come anyway. Why don't I ask her? You could cop another present out of it. Yeah? A smile came back. Slide slow. She'll have to make it a good one, too. <laughs> That's the spirit. End of chapter 14.